Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fierce Reads panel, taking the general out of genre. I am Trisha Levenseller, and I will be moderating this panel. Uh, just a little bit about this panel. Uh, the description is, it is no secret that YA literature is the most groundbreaking when it comes to exploring identity, growing pains, and growing up. But that doesn't mean it can't also be a rip-roaring adventure. Join these YA authors as they discuss how they balance high stakes and relatable narratives. Could you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves one by one, please? Let's go ahead and start with Kayla. Hi, my name is Kayla Ancrum. My pen name is Kay Ancrum. Um, I'm the author of the upcoming Peter Pan adaption, Darling. My pronouns are she, her, and you can find me on Twitter at Kayla Ancrum. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Zoe. Hi, I'm Zoe Hanamakuda, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm the debut author of Gearbreakers, which is a YA sci-fi about queer girls hunting down 200-foot mecha deities in the desert and falling in love. Uh, all my socials are my full name, Zoe Hanamakuda, and ada.com for that from the website. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Zabay. Hi, I'm Zabay, author of May the Best Man Win, and I write as Z.R. Eller. And, uh, and my social media handles uh, and my pronouns are he, him, and my social media handles are at ZRLer on Twitter and Zabay underscore pics on Instagram. All right, and Joan. Hi, my name is Joan He. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm the author of the recently released uh, The Ones We're Meant to Find, which is about two sisters who are trying to find each other across the sea. Um, on social media, you can find me at, uh, at Joan He Writes. And Joan hit the New York Times. Congrats, Joan. That's so exciting. You need to say that. That's awesome. Um, oh, and I neglected to say I'm Trisha Levenseller. I write young adult fantasy books. My latest is Blade of Secrets. Uh, which is about a teenage blacksmith with social anxiety who can craft magical weapons. And my pronouns are she, her. And you can find me on social media at my name just about anywhere. All right. So to get this panel started, I wanted to go ahead and ask you guys, why YA? Why are you writing YA? We could do a lot of these things in adult if we wanted to, but what is it about YA that, that draws you in? Um, let's go ahead and start with Joan this time. Um, so I think like when I got into writing, it was because of like uh, TV shows and books that I read or watched um, when I was a kid, like Spirit Away really emotionally damaged me. Um, and then later on when I was reading like The Hunger Games, like those books, I feel like they just stayed with me. Um, and even though I'm obviously still reading now as like an adult, um, I just feel like the themes and like the characters and just the feelings that you encounter in books when you are a kid, um, they just have this formative staying power. And so I write with the hopes that maybe a kid will feel the same way about my stories that I did when I was a kid. I love that. Thank you. Zabay, what about you? Yeah, absolutely. So I write both YA and adult, but I knew that for the May the Best Man Win that I really wanted it to be a YA novel because I wanted to write a novel with trans representation in a story for teenagers. You know, I'm trans and when I was growing up, I really didn't know what that was and I didn't really see it um, represented in any of the books I was reading. So it was really important to me to um, create something for queer teenagers who are just figuring out their identities and to create something that could reflect their identities back at them and, you know, be the sort of book that I wish I had when I was in high school. I love that. Thank you. Zoe, what about you? Yeah, I think the term growing pains was mentioned earlier, and I think that's a really good, um, that's a really good term for the YA genre. Um, Absolutely. You're, you're kind of growing up with the characters in a way when you're reading along. Um, and just for uh, Gear Breakers, I was the same age as my characters when I started writing it. So um, oh, I love it, that. It, yeah. So I really did feel like I'm growing up. I was growing up with them. And um, I'm also hoping, uh, like ZR, that um, uh, that teenagers uh, will find represent like queer teens will be able to find uh, the representation that I would have wanted when I was um, in in the lower YA range. So, definitely. <laughs> Thank you, and Kayla. 
Um, I actually wrote uh, my book at the same time as you were here. So I was the same kind of age. Um, and I think that there's a thing that um, authors who are writing an adult while they are young adults share is that we kind of transition seamlessly from the trying to portray our own experience into the I'm an educator with responsibilities to this community kind of understanding of what it means to be a young adult author. So I think that um, one of the things that really keeps me in this age range is understanding that I'm producing content that is going to be impacting a generation of children. And because I write LGBTQ um, work might affect a generation behind that if we you know, go through a period of not having as many works out as well. So I feel like it's definitely something that um, affects people who understand the responsibility of creating content. Very nice. Uh, okay, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about writing. I don't know about you guys, but when I sit down to write a book, what's first and foremost on my mind is I want to be different, right? I'm writing fantasy. It's a super over flooded market right now. It's it's hard to stand out. You want to get picked up. You want that novel that that readers want to read. Um, so I just want to ask you guys, do you, do you think about this too? Do you think about how can I be different when I sit down to when you sit down to write a novel? And then how does diversity also come into play with that? Um, Zoe, would you like to start this time? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. I definitely like have worries about uh, um, just the whole YA market's really oversaturated with the speculative fiction. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the whole own voices movement really brings um, um, a new gleam to that when I'm sitting down. I feel uh, more confident writing within my own uh, demographic uh, because it's something that's less saturated out there. Um, and that's what I have to say about it. <laughs> no, that was perfect. Thank you. What about you, Joan? Um, I feel like I, even though like, um, as mentioned, like the market is saturated, when I'm writing my books, I kind of have the opposite issue where um, I, I feel like maybe when they first come at me, they feel almost too different. And I've encountered this problem where when I was writing like the debut, um, my debut Descendant of the Crane, which is this Chinese inspired fantasy, my first draft, I actually watered down the Chinese cultural aspects by like making it half China, half Rome, because I was afraid of it being too different from what was already out there. And a lot of my revision process for both that book and for the ones we're meant to find um, is actually kind of reversing that dilution. Um, like in the case of the ones we're meant to find, I feel like I had a character who was very quiet um, um, and just personality wise, much closer to me, I guess, than maybe some other young adult protagonists out there. And I really watered her down in like the first draft. So yeah, I guess it's that awareness that it is saturated, but I still feel like I have to meet the reader somewhere in the middle and the market somewhere in the middle. Oh, interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Kayla. Um, I definitely feel like the work that I produce is really unusual and in some ways unpalatable. Um, so it takes me a while to kind of like dial things down to being like a little bit more, you know, like palatable for the market. Um, I write what I like to call representational fiction. I grew up in Chicago in a big city. I went to an art school. We had lots and lots of different types of people, lots of different experiences, lots of different kinds of families. So I try my best to write what was there. And what was there might not be as clean <laughs> as what people want. So um, a lot of the times, you know, I'll bring my work to my editors and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We, we can't have this. We can try something similar, but we can't have this. And, you know, I just want to try my best to create as close to what I saw when I myself was a teenager or a child, because I think that it's important to okay. not just diverse by books, but to show what is there, what can be there, what was there for certain people. Awesome. Thank you. Zabe? Yeah, I, I think for me, you know, it was one thing I, I think about when I'm writing, especially when I'm doing YA contemporary, um, like with, with May the Best Man Win, was I wanted to look for a way <clears throat> that I could um, explore my identity and explore my experiences to put a fresh spin on kind of a classic story. Um, because, you know, kind of the way I first pitched May the Best Man Win to my agent is, it's um, Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda meets Mean Girls. Oh, 
<laughs> and so I really like, oh, so, you know, you've got like this cheerleader and dating the head quarter, dating the uh, football player, and they're going to run for homecoming court, and there's all this drama, but at the same time, it's like, oh, the head cheerleader is a trans guy. And so he's figuring out his identity and he's kind of like navigating this, this interesting world of gender because, okay, what does it mean to be like a cheerleader who's a guy? And what does it mean to be a guy who likes guys and who maybe didn't know he was a guy until a few months ago? And who, who is navigating this, this world where like all these tropes and templates kind of that we have about teenage life are really flipped on their heads because they're so related to gender and so mm -hmm. that was kind of how I crafted the hook for the story was kind of looking at these classic tropes and being like here is where my personal experience and my personal viewpoint can update and explore these tropes in a new and interesting way. I love that. Thank you. Uh, I want to dig just a little bit deeper into this question, and I'm going to break you guys up into two groups. So first, I want to ask our contemporary writers, uh, Kayla and Zabe, uh, how did you go about making a contemporary world so unique and readable when people are already familiar with our world? You have to work a little bit harder, I would think, in a way to, to be different and even stand out more because people are already so familiar with, you know, um, with being a teenager in high school and things like that. So I wanted to ask how you approach that. Let's start with Zabe this time. Yeah, so I think one thing I really wanted to bring in was um, kind of my own experiences growing up in the Washington, D.C. area and kind of going to a very fancy, I, I hate that word, very, very, very <laughs> like fancy, very like exclusive like school um, with a lot of rich kids and a lot of um, a lot of drama. And so that's why we have the setting of this Maryland um, private school. It's, you know, based off a school that is very close to where I live. Um, you know, it, it's full of all these very, like, ostent ostentatious um, teens with too, with too much money, um, <laughs> but who have, who have a lot of problems. Um, and so I kind of wanted to, to draw on some of that weirdness and some of that eccentricity of growing up in a place like that and really bring that in um, to the story. And like, I think nothing captures it as well as like the amount of like time and resources devoted to homecoming. It's like, oh, we're just gonna give the uh, homecoming committee $30,000 to put on the dance and, and that'll be fine. Like we can just, we can just burn that to, put on a party and and yeah so that was kind of the the weird and unique part of the contemporary world that I wanted to explore because I knew that so well and I thought that that would be really entertaining to um to YA readers who love teen drama oh absolutely I really enjoyed that aspect of the story uh Kayla what do you have to add so um I I write contemporary fiction but I like to write like, contemporary with a slant so I'll do like contemporary with like a little bit of sci-fi contemporary with a little uh -huh. bit of horror contemporary with <laughs> so I, I want people who enjoy contemporary to like get that just like a little bit of a taste you know um because I feel like that's something that a lot of the times they like crave just like a little bit of sprinkles on some stuff um but also it's kind of a little bit directly related to my disability <laughs> I'm kind of well known for having ADHD um one of the things that I struggle with a lot is like spatial awareness and as a result of that I'm extraordinarily terrible at knowing how to do description in my own work, like where people want to know what the, what things look like. So um, as a way to bolster that, I actually put significantly more work into my dialogue and into creating like these interpersonal exchanges between the characters that kind of like are so snappy and funny and interesting that you don't really notice that you don't know what's going on around them visually. So um, between that and, you know, the like adding a little bit of uh, like genre fiction into my contemporary, I try to create this world that feels both realistic, but also like a little bit magical, familiar, but also a little bit fantastical, um, in which, you know, my characters are kind of familiar because they're diverse and they're rooted in reality, but the circumstances are like 
almost so unusual that they're fantasy feeling. So um, that's what I do. <laughs> I love that. No, I super love that element of your story. And I think that really makes you stand out for sure. Um, okay, our futuristic writers. So how do you guys go about your world building and making a world that's a possible reality for our futures? Uh, let's start with Joan this time. Yeah, so I'm um, pretty awful at world building, actually, and when I'm, like, drafting. Oh, I would argue with that. <laughs> Your world building is phenomenal. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that really I have to work on and layer in, in the revision process, because when I'm first drafting, the world really comes as a product of what's required from the story, and I guess with the ones we're meant to find, I knew that it, for, like, the twist and the plot, I knew that it needed to be this almost apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic world. And so I was just thinking like, what would the world be ending from? And that's how climate change came into play because it just felt like the most plausible reason that would require readers to suspend the least disbelief. Um, as for like how like the tech elements then got built in, I actually struggle. Um, I found I struggled with the sci-fi because even though I know like contemporary feels familiar, I actually feel like with science, like a lot of times when you do get down to like the core principles behind new technologies, they all kind of do funnel into like one sort of invention. Like I think everyone knows like you can link minds and like Elon Musk has now like invented these things, like the pebble things that you sometimes see in Black Mirror where you put them on your head and they can like record memories. Like I feel like everything's kind of the same. So really the struggle for me is trying to take little elements that you might have already seen in science fiction and putting them together in a story that is unique um, and with characters who do reflect like my marginalization and have that be the thing that makes it different. Fantastic, thank you. Zoe? Uh, yeah, so for Gear Breakers, I, well, I guess just sci-fi in general, I don't know anything about STEM. So I set everything so far in the future that no one can check me on any of the science going <laughs> out for it, um, which is fine. Um, but Gear Breakers, it kind of blends a little into fantasy uh, because the the ginormous mechas, they're worshipped as gods. So what I kind of wanted to try doing was putting everything so far in the future that like it's almost the implication that history repeats itself or like we're reverting back to these gods, but it's like um, has tech entangled with religion now um so I don't know I just I wanted to do something that um I I hadn't seen before for the world building um but it's also at the same time like a very classic um trope where everything's been like nuclear fried war after war um but again that implication that like the violence just keeps repeating themselves so like the world in that um, respect kind of reflects um, the the mission I was trying to go for, which was like exploring how violence is uh, a cycle that needs to be broken because it just will keep happening and someone needs to step up and do something about it. Awesome, thank you. Um, so uh, I was on submission three times before uh, I finally sold the book. It was my fourth book though. And uh, constantly when I got rejection, something I always heard from people was, oh, the voice didn't connect with me. And I'm sure you all you guys can all relate to that. Like, I don't know, that was just a favorite rejection that I got, the voice, the voice, the voice. So I wanna ask, how did you guys go about crafting a unique voice for your most recent book? How did you um, stand out, you know? There's so many voices in way. How did you go about crafting that voice? Uh, let's start with Zabay. Yeah, so um, so this the voice um, was really the first aspect of May the Best Man Win that I nailed down. And there's actually two distinct voices in it. There's Jeremy, and then there's Lucas, um, his ex-boyfriend. And they kind of go back and forth in this little dueling um, POV thing as they both compete against each other for Homecoming King. And so one of the things that I did to kind of get in the spirit was I downloaded um, all the old playlists that I used to listen to in high school. And so it was like, oh my, all my like, like wake me up inside by Evanescence. <laughs> so I, was, <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> all my, all my old, like good Charlotte. Like, so yeah. So I was a very emo um, high schooler 
And so like, but then I just like put this music on and it just kind of like snapped me back and like, they're just like, oh, like no one understands what I'm going through. And I'm just going through this terrible thing that no one has ever gone through before. And like, everything is awful. And um, and both their lives are re really challenging and they're both, both going through some pretty challenging things in their own ways. And so like once, so that kind of helped me tap into like their angst and their different kinds of angst. Um, and so, and then, then I then I just like kind of knew that they would just both react in different ways. You know, Jeremy, he's really dealing with transitioning and trying to figure out all these new social expectations. And so he he gets very angry and upset and like defensive um, as as he's trying to like figure out his new place in this world. And Lucas, uh, his older brother, just passed away. Um, his parents. Um, are, are fighting a lot. And so he kind of deals with that by just like trying to like shove it all down and like ignore that and just be a total perfectionist. And, and so once I kind of figured out what they were both going through and how they were both coping with it, then the voices just like snap, like they just float out of me. Oh, I like that a lot. Uh, what about you, Joan? Um, so for me, the, I kind of like Zabay, I also have two like point of views um, and one of the voices definitely came first because of the idea and the twist. I knew that I needed one character to kind of um, draw from, let me, let me just explain the twist real quick. So like the way the twist came to me was that I had this image of a girl trying to look for someone in the sea. Um, and I knew that she was searching for this person and I wasn't sure who the person was. Um, and I thought back to some of the tropes that I'd read about in young adult dystopian when I was a teen. And one of those tropes oftentimes is that you do have this really capable, um, relatable character who goes on to do incredible things, but they're made relatable and they're made human because they oftentimes have a relationship that they care about and that they need to protect. Um, and sometimes that relationship is a younger sibling. So I wanted to subvert that trope and have the younger sibling actually be the one driving the plot and being so much more than a device to make the character relatable. So I knew immediately that the older sibling needed to kind of um, pay homage to some of like the young adult heroines that I'd read about. And so the voice for me really was drawing from those popular traits I found, like a certain level of emotional vulnerability, this grittiness, this determination, this kind of bounce in her voice. And once I had that character's voice, like the super relatable, relatable as the genre has taught us voice, I then went on to build the second voice, which would have been the younger sibling. And I made that completely different from um, the other point of view. And so it really started from the idea of this twist and how I wanted the character to also conceptualize it. Awesome. Thank you. Zoe? Oh, yes. This is more general, I suppose. But uh, I think just like writing what you have fun with is really important because I definitely like with gear breakers just put in like all the tropes all the representation that I like wanted to write and just ran with it but I feel like with that um like instead of like appealing to what, what you think publishing the publishing path wants like you can feel yourself relaxing a little bit into it um and I think like that helps to like distinctify the voices like for gear breakers there's two points of view and so like I had to um like distinguishing them was like a more difficult bit, but I found like when I was just writing along, like not really worrying about it too much at the beginning, um, then they kind of like ended up distinctifying in my head, uh, like how, like basically like toward the second half of the manuscript, I, when, when I'm reading along, like their actual voices are like different in my head as like, I'm uh, like, I don't know. When, when you read, you know, you hear the little, the little uh, narrator going along, but definitely like when I had those down, um, I had to go back to the first part of the manuscript and kind of refine to um, appeal to what they had turned out to be, but definitely like you need to like relax into it. I don't think you need to um, 
I don't know, like for, for my writing specifically, like if I nitpick too much, especially on the first draft, which I'm really bad with, and I just stall. So I just have to go and it kind of pans out. It's like, a, you know, like a, like a muscle you have to um, exercise, I suppose. No, I love that. I love hearing about how everybody goes about it a different way. What about you, Kayla? Um, so weirdly, I am an author that's more spot inspired by like movies and films than I am by other books. So one of the things that I really like bringing into my own work is this like cinematic quality. And a lot of my books kind of follow more of like a, a cinematic, like rising action conflict and resolution uh, format. Um, for Darling, my Peter Pan adaption, um, I'm really inspired by horror movies. I feel like the most impactful horror movies are ones in which the main character is actively doing everything they can to survive and trying to make the best decisions based on the information that they know and still get foiled and still get got. <laughs> I feel like, like the like stress and you know like tension of being like oh you should do this thing and they do it and it still doesn't work is something that I really wanted to like really richly bring into this work and um, when you're doing an adaption of an ex existing text you understand that you're coming to this work from the perspective of somebody who is aware that their audience has previously consumed the original text and already has feelings about it so in a combination of wanting to do um, honor towards that and also wanting to make sure that I you know created this richness um, with the stress and thriller aspects of the book, I decided to have my main character, Wendy, be a smart girl who lives in a very like opulent suburb who moves to the big city just in time for meeting Peter Pan. So she's coming in and she's like, you know, I got my cell phone, I know to order Ubers, like, you know, I can do Google Maps on my phone, you know, if I'm going to go somewhere with this hot guy, like I can get myself out and then her phone starts <laughs> dying and she's like, okay, okay. All right, there are no payphones anymore because payphones are over. My cell phone is gone. I can't text my mom. Like, <laughs> I don't know where I am. Like, I vaguely understand the train system, but like, not really. So there's this guy and I just met him and he only seems safe because there are women around him, which is Tinkerbell and the Tiger Lily replacement that I did named Aminatago, who is an Ojibwe um, indigenous American character. So she's like, okay, girls, girls are kind of safe. Guys, mm, girls, mm. We'll try this we'll try this the only way that i know how to get home is staying with these complete strangers until the night is over so <laughs> the book is kind of like a um uh nick and nora's infinite playlist one long horrible night meets dark thriller murder drama <laughs> so <laughs> i really wanted the voice that i created for that to be as true to the kind of like gen z experience of I can take on the world with technology, but having that technology fail them and being completely unable to do anything to save themselves other than be very, very smart and extraordinarily vigilant about their circumstances. I love that. And you did that so very well, for sure. Uh, I really enjoyed that aspect of the book. <laughs> um, okay, guys. So in YA, we often have to let our characters make mistakes, right? They're teenagers. They're gonna do things wrong sometimes the first time, right? So I wanted to ask, how do we do that without making our characters so unlikable that readers don't wanna read about them? Sometimes I struggle with that. I don't know if you guys struggle with that, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, let's start with Zoe. Um, I think you definitely need some kind of uh, reconciliation <laughs> whenever there's a mistake made, um, or I guess maybe not now that I think about it, but like really lean into one way um, or the other in accordance with their personality. I think it's maybe less about making them relatable and more about making them feel real um, mm -hmm. because then you, I don't know, if you're, I feel like if you're like a reader and you're like, wow, this this is a terrible decision, but it seems really true to who they are. I can't really argue uh -huh. with it. Um, so I guess, yeah, I, I guess that's, is that a terrible decision maybe? But uh, <laughs> No, I thought that was a great answer. Uh, Zabe? Yeah, um, I, I mean, it's interesting because like, especially for me when I was um, writing, like I knew that, you know, Jeremy and Lucas, like they both make some pretty bad decisions or like decisions that hurt other people's feelings or their friends' feelings. Um, and so what I tried to be very conscious of was like, was showing kind of what motivated them. Because I think, you know, especially when we're teenagers and we don't 
really have like a lot of experience with conflict and dealing with conflict in our lives, like it's so easy to let um, to let something stressful or something traumatic like bubble out in a way we don't intend. And like a lot of times, you know, for teenagers, something stressful at home or something stressful like with a teacher can like boil out into fighting with a friend or just saying something like mean that we didn't intend or to just not understanding you know, that our friends also have needs and we need to put them first. And so kind of one of the things I wanted to show over the course of my book is the characters like slowly becoming aware of how they've been um, irresponsible and how they've actually like hurt other people's feelings and to kind of have these moments. And, you know, it's, it's a sh- it takes place over three weeks and, you know, obviously like you can't really do the whole like learning how to be um, a responsible adult because like that takes a lot of time and energy. But I <laughs> wanted to show kind of within this situation that these teenagers really learn how to get a better handle on how they handle um, negative situations and to really show that a lot of their bad behavior and a lot of their mistakes grow out of the stress that they're under and that they learn a better way to deal um, with what they're going through. Thank you. Kayla? So um, I do uh, two different things. The first thing is um, keeping in line with kind of like the cinematic quality. When you're reading a book, it feels very much like you're standing beside the characters or like you're having a one-on-one personal conversation with the author. Um, A lot of my books feel like you're um, looking into a shadow box. There's this like kind of fourth wall where you can't like really emotionally connect with the characters. So you just kind of like watch them doing stuff and you're like, yikes. (laughs) (laughs) And then there's this other thing where like, usually especially like teenagers when they make bad decisions they realize that they've made a bad decision relatively quickly there's always this moment where they're like oh my god oh my god this shouldn't be something that i should have done and there's just like this pause where they're just kind of panicking internally i put those moments in my book so my character would i don't know do something like i don't know just something weird then there'll be like a moment they're like bad decision bad decision i wish i could walk that back i can't okay all right we gotta deal with this I deal with this <laughs> like, just that kind of emotion which is it's one of those like nameless like hysteria mixed with regret mixed with comedy kind of emotions that you don't really see in books as often but happen like a lot in real life I make sure to like put those moments in so that when the reader is reading they're like oh my god why'd you do that that was so ridiculous and the characters like immediately that was so ridiculous and it, it <laughs> makes them feel like they're about it are validated because they instantaneously learn that, they, that there was a lesson to be learned from their own action. I love that answer, thank you. Joan? Um, I guess for me, I really just tried to blend everything back into agency because I feel like I don't really think of my characters as making mistakes, but more that at the given circumstance and the situation and with the information they had and them thinking they had agency, they probably did something that then in hindsight was a mistake. And I feel like it's not necessarily isolated to teenagers because um, I think as like psychology and like experiments such as Milgram's have shown, everyone thinks that they have more agency than they actually do. And they have more free will than they actually do. And people will do things and then outsiders like bystanders will say like, that's so stupid. Like I never would have done the same thing. But the thing is once you're placed in that situation, oftentimes you're not that different from the person next to you. So I guess when I'm writing my characters, even though they're teens, I feel like they are the same as adults in that way. And I hope that no one, I know readers can be like, oh no, like why did she do that? But I think at the end of the day, I really try to show that if you were in a situation like that, teen or not, you would probably not act in like the most correct way. Awesome. Thank you guys. I loved all your answers for that one. That was great. Um, We're running out of time. So I think we have time for like one more question. Um, And I want to use this one. Um, I get asked so often, uh, why do you write female main characters? Or why, why do you write these strong female characters? And I'm so sick of answering like a strong female character doesn't necessarily mean she's physically strong. You know, she can be strong emotionally. She can be strong mentally. She can do all of these things, right? Really what I'm doing is I'm making 
three-dimensional females just as three-dimensional as the males and like people are surprised by this for some reason and I'm so sick of answering it and so sick of talking about it so I just want to ask you guys what things in YA in your genres are you ready to be normalized so that people just stop asking you about it okay does that make sense um let's start with Kayla this <laughs> probably Unless you're not ready <laughs> I know. I was just like, ah. <laughs> I'll be being asked like, why I include diversity and stuff. Like, I think at every mm -hmm. single interview, except for maybe three or four, I've been asked that. And it's just kind of like, because the people are there, they're outside, you're walking around, you know? So like, I, I would really like, you know, that, that sort of thing. Like I'm an African-American, you know, woman and I, it's important to me to see people who come from different backgrounds, you know? Absolutely, thank you. Joan? Yeah, similar to Kayla, I'd say like, in, in the case of like the ones we meant to find, even though it's not about culture, it's not about race, like the characters are Asian because like I just wanted to make them so. Um, and I guess the other thing I wish would be normalized is again, like different kinds of personalities, different kinds of voices, I think, um, even though there are so many different voices in young adult and in like young adult sci-fi fantasy, I feel like sometimes we do conflate like likability, relatability, agency with a certain kind of voice. And I hope that one day there's more acceptance of like the quieter kind of character. Awesome. Thank you. Zoe? Yeah, I, I feel like I'm going to get questions like, oh, why is everyone queer coded and Korean coded? I think the answer is just because I could, so I did. <laughs> I don't, like, why not? I don't, like, it's I don't my book. Because <laughs> yeah, like, I did, I don't know. <laughs> no, I like that. Very straightforward. I like that. Zabe? Yeah, I think the one thing I'd, I'd like to ditch is the idea that, y, that YA fiction has, like, an obligation to teach readers something. I know that, like, writers that they're like, oh, like, your, your book didn't teach me about what it's like to be oh. trans or your book didn't teach a good lesson to like the children reading it. And I'm like, there's a whole genre of books that are meant to like teach children things. It's called nonfiction and you can buy those <laughs> in the nonfiction section. But you know, I, I wrote this book to entertain teenagers and like I packed it full of drama to entertain. Like I'm not trying to teach teenagers the right thing to do. Like teenagers will figure out what the right thing to do is on their own through living their own lives and making their own mistakes and learning from those but like I wrote it so like teenagers could read it and have fun and and not necessarily like I, I do not want teenagers to learn anything from this I want them to have a good time fabulous thank you so much I loved that answer all right is there any final comments any of you guys would like to share about this topic about what we've been discussing we have just like one or two minutes so if there's anything else you feel like you wanted to cover but we didn't uh go ahead anything anyone would like to say um, I just wanted to say thank you for showing up for us. Um, I published my first book in 2017 and I've gotten to see like the attendance for these kind of events with diverse, interesting people like all of us slowly go up. And I just wanted to say like, if you guys didn't show up to these things, they would stop booking us. So <laughs> thank you so much for attending this event. I love that. Anyone else? Thank you so much for being a great host, Trisha. This has been really awesome. Oh, for sure. Thanks, guys. It's been Thank so you, fun Trisha. to have you all here. Absolutely. You guys made this so easy. I, I worried for nothing. So... Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much for uh, showing up to this panel for our audience and uh, go out and read more. 